good morning, and, and thank you, Raz, for that kind int introduction. Um, yeah, I am a bit of a control freak. Uh, remote controls have been uh, my passion uh, ever since I got involved in broadcasting uh, many decades ago. Um, and one of the first things I did with uh, remote control, um, I had the opportunity to um, do a, a facility consolidation with Greater Media back in um, the late 1990s, uh, where when deregulation was changing. And uh, one of the first things that we did was um, put all the stations, the studios in one location and the transmitters were spread out all over the place. And at that time, there were a few commercial remote control systems that were able to do some, some of that kind of stuff, but it was very expensive. So um, I took the opportunity to use RS-232 and um, a bunch of peripherals that, uh, that I, that I uh, cobbled together and put all the facilities together um, on one screen. And that was the beginning of really my passion for uh, remote control work. And as time developed and you know, um, we had PPM um, assurance and uh, other things to monitor, the system just kind of grew. So that's kind of where I came from. Uh, today, I want to talk a little bit about modern remote control systems and specifically how to get the most out of the remote control system that you may have. So there's a little bit of um, discussion on virtual channels, which I think is a really um, interesting and useful uh, feature that many remote controls offer. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that. And then I'm going to end the talk um, with uh, something that relates closely to the repack, and that is monitoring for um, uh, system performance for uh, multiplexed antenna systems. So again, um, to consolidate the monitoring and, um, con and control for remote uh, site functions, that's one of the big advantages that we uh, have now with the technology uh, that's come forward for remote controls. Um, we're also able to manage national, regional, and local market uh, network, network operations centers, or what we call NOCs. Um, a lot of clients have come to us and say, we, you know, because of deregulation, we own so many stations, we want to be able to put all this information together on one screen. Today's technology, many remote control companies offer this kind of capability, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that and the advantages of using that. Um, as I mentioned, uh, virtual channels are very powerful um, features of modern remote controls that can offer you the ability to dynamically calculate items like transmitter efficiency, heat rise, VSWR levels. And um, using autonomous capabilities to react to changes in status without human intervention, such as if a transmitter fails, uh, maybe you don't have an operator on duty at the time, or maybe an engineer is not available. You want to be able to have your systems automatically switch over to a backup, and uh, most uh, remote controls nowadays offer those capabilities. And also, um, alarms. We're, we're monitoring so many different things nowadays um, that it's quite possible for a barrage of alarms to come in and be overwhelming to the engineer. So managing those alarms in an uh, efficient way is an important um, thing to be able to do today, and some of the remote control systems that are out there allow for that to happen. So today we see things like this. We have a remote control system that can talk to various peripheral devices um, using GPIO, using RS-232, and of course SNMP has become popular. SNMP um, is the way things are going with the one single uh, Ethernet connection. Um, in many cases, you can monitor hundreds of parameters, and not just a broadcast equipment, but as you see, power systems, air chain, um, air chain processors, uh, printers. Uh, it's a standard that um, doesn't only apply to broadcast. So um, remote control manufacturers have embraced SNMP. The other um, big advantage is, of course, the equipment doesn't need to be in close proximity to your station or to the remote control because it's IP-based. So it could be, uh, you could be monitoring equipment that's halfway around the world as long as you have an IP connection. So let's talk first about network operations centers. Um, the consolidation has obviously given us a um, opportunity to uh, use centralized control for monitoring multiple sites that are geographically 
diverse. Some of the larger radio companies have contacted my company and said, you know, we've got four or five hundred radio stations and we'd like to be more efficient about monitoring what's going on with those stations. Can you put together a NOC, a network operations center for us? And that's certainly possible to do with today's remote controls that are IP-based. This is an example of a local uh, market NOC screen, and this is just a local market. And you can imagine uh, if the company owns uh, facilities in dozens of markets, uh, how these screens can be designed to summarize uh, the conditions in each market. But as you can see, um, here, we're looking at forward and reflected power for each station. There are graphs that show um, histories. Um, and basically, you get a, a picture of exactly what's going on, not with just one station, but with, with many. And if you take this to a regional, a uh, national view, you can see that it's possible to put together a geographical map that shows um, each uh, region or each market, um, however you want to break it down, with uh, simple red, green, yellow boxes that uh, can depict whether the stations are healthy on the air, whether there's a problem, or whether there is a pro problem that is not severe but might become a problem, and that can be color-coded in yellow. Virtual channels. Um, I don't know if you guys have um, used virtual channels, but I've kind of been a big fan of them um, for a while. A virtual channel, the definition is a channel on a remote control that you can define whose value can be determined by other channels using either a simple math formula or Boolean logic. And basically, there are two types of these virtual channels. One is analog, such as analog readings from a transmitter, and the other would be status readings, uh, whether a door is open or whether a, a transmitter is on or off. One example of using a virtual channel is to simply calculate the transmitter efficiency. And as we all know, um, the simple formula for that is efficiency in percent equals 100 times the power in watts over the volts times the amps. So pretty, pretty straightforward stuff. And you can uh, simplify that uh, by uh, converting it to uh, kilowatts, because that's what many stations use. And further, uh, simplify the formula to show that the efficiency is 100 times the power over the um, power in kilowatts over the PA kilovolts over the amps. So to actually use the uh, and define the um, virtual channel, you have to define the main channels first. So if we take this example and we let channel 1 be the measured PA kilovolts, channel 2 be the amps, channel 3 be the measured power output such as uh, from a, a watt meter, um, and we can uh, then define this virtual channel, which we'll call channel number four, to be the calculated PA uh, transmitter efficiency. So that would be the channel that would be dynamically changing multiple times per second and showing you the actual efficiency of the transmitter that's calculated based on the formula that you see there. So here's an example um, of how you can do it on, on the remote control that uh, Burke makes. Um, and there are, again, there are other remote controls that can do this kind of thing. But here we're defining um, the transmitter voltage, uh, PA voltage, to come in on um, meter number 11. I think I have a pointer here. Mm. Well, anyway, on the top line there, I don't know where the, uh, the laser pointer is on this thing, but um, we're, we're showing the, the PA voltage to be on channel number one the PA current to be on channel number two, transmitter power um, in kilowatts on, chan on uh, channel number three. And you can see the formula that I've highlighted there in yellow is 100 times meter channel number three, which is the power, uh, over um, meter channel number one, which is the plate kilovolts, and oh, divide that by meter channel number two. Oh, this one is a little. Right. Great. Thank you. Yeah, there we go. Okay. Uh, but the clicker for this one works. <laughs> Got to use two of these. Uh, so anyway, um, this is the formula, um, and these are the calculations putting in the actual numbers. And so you can see the efficiency there um, is 70.1%. 
Um, so this meter here would be defined to dynamically display the transmitter efficiency. So why would you want to do that? Well, with this, you can actually take that efficiency number and graph it over, over time to look at what's happening. You can alarm on changes on efficiency. If something's changing with the transmitter, you can uh, recognize that pretty easily. And that, that allows you to predict potential failures, recognize metering problems, and of course, proactively, in the case where you're using a transmitter that has a tube that has a um, specific life to it, you can order new tubes only when needed. So we can take this to the, uh, the next level and do um, calculations for indirect power. Of course, the formula there is the power equals the volts times the amps times the efficiency factor. For indirect, um, we let channel one equal the measured power in kilovolts, channel two the measured power in amps, and the efficiency factor is the published uh, efficiency factor from the, um, the, the transmitter manufacturer. So in this case, we're going to define a fifth channel, channel number five, to be the calculated indirect power. And uh, here is our voltage, channel number one. Channel number two is the actual uh, transmitter plate current. Uh, transmitter three is the power output in kilowatts. And here's our formula. Um, meter channel number one times meter channel number two times the published efficiency factor for the transmitter, and that would define the value that comes out on channel number five, which is um, our virtual channel. And of course, you can see down to here displayed dynamically is the indirect power. And there's the math. So why would you want to do this? Again, with dynamically calculated indirect power, you're able to confirm the direct power meter readings if you have a watt meter. Um, you can estimate the power output without a direct power meter, which many stations may not own. Um, of course, this is helpful to confirm ongoing compliance with the FCC power limits. Another use for uh, virtual channels is to calculate and display VSWR. Um, in order to do this, you need a few different things. In fact, you need two virtual channels uh, to do this. Um, rho is the re reflection coefficient, which is simply defined by the square root of the reflected power in watts over the forward power in watts. VSWR is then calculated um, by uh, taking one plus rho and dividing it by one minus rho. So if we look at this, here's another example of using virtual channels. We let channel number 129 equal the measured forward power in watts, channel 130 equal the reflected power in watts, and then we need a, a, a placeholder to define virtual channel, say number 131, to be the calculated value of rho, and 132 to be the calculated VSWR, the final product that we want to look at. And so here's uh, how that's actually implemented. Again, we have the forward power and reflected power uh, coming from uh, DC samples from, say, the transmitter or uh, uh, directional coupler values. And then over here, as I uh, had just mentioned, uh, calculating rho is done by taking the square root of these two meter channels, 130 over 129. And finally, the VSWR in this channel, 132, is calculated uh, very simply by taking one plus uh, meter channel number 131, um, which is rho, over one minus channel 131. And there, again, is the math in this particular case where I've uh, chosen some values, uh, and we're calculating the VSWR at 1.16 to 1, and we're displaying that uh, in, the, in the graph below. So what are the advantages of doing something like this? Well, if you have a dynamically calculated VSWR, you can look at um, VSWR um, trends before they become problems. So you can alarm on changes in VSWR that occur. You can graph the VSWR over time if you have um, external conditions like weather conditions or icing or wind conditions that may be affecting something mechanically on the tower. You're able to, uh, to look at those and correlate those sometimes with um, environmental data. 
um, automatically turn on de-icing equipment. Some people just turn them on when the um, temperature and dew point get close or when they notice that they're in a position where they're getting icing. Um, but the more information you have, the better. And if you see the VSWR starting to creep up, uh, it, it can allow you to uh, take preventive action um, sooner. And this tool with the virtual channel allows you to, to see those trends. And uh, another thing that we've uh, done and, and is popular is to look at the efficiency of the transmitter through heat rise. And this is very simple to do, taking the exhaust air temperature and subtracting it from, subtracting uh, the supply air temperature from that exhaust air temperature. And again, using a virtual channel to do this, we can let channel say 153 equal the measured supply air temperature, 154 the measured exhaust temperature, and 155 to be the calculated heat rise. And uh, again, um, this looks familiar. Um, we're looking at the supply air temperature as 153. That happens to be 72 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, we're looking at the exhaust temperature, which in this case is 125 degrees Fahrenheit. And it's a simple matter to calculate the stack temperature rise, uh, measure channel 154 minus channel 153. And here we are displaying it at the bottom and you can display it in any way you want. And of course, you can detect small changes in transmission, uh, transmitter efficiency this way. Um, subtle changes in airflow uh, will also show up uh, as a increased uh, or decreased um, uh, stack temperature rise. Um, and that can lead you to look at the air blowers to see if they're moving the proper amount of air they're supposed to be moving. I'm going to talk a little bit now about using Boolean logic to um, determine what transmitter is on the air and simplify readings. Um, this is an example of where we can use um, information from the coaxial antenna switch position to actually um, help us display uh, forward power uh, in a more meaningful way to an operator that may or may not be technical. In this case, if we look at um, transmitter A forward power on, say, an analog channel number 158 and the B power on channel 159, we're also taking into consideration um, status. And in this case, we're looking at the RF coax switch status position A. In other words, if the coax switch is seated in uh, transmitter uh, position A is on the air, um, this status channel would be a 1 or true. If it's not seated, it would be zero or false. Same thing with channel 159. So we know which position the coax switch is in. And so then we can define uh, another virtual channel, virtual channel 160, to be the on-air transmitter power. That would be an analog channel. And what we can do here is um, uh, we're looking at the analog values here on channel 158 and 159. These are, these are analog values. Um, say transmitter B is on the air right now and that's producing 27.4 kilowatts. Transmitter A is, is idle. And then here we combine this information with the uh, status channels. This is status channel 158 and 159. These are um, either true or false. And in this case we see that um, the coax switch is in position B which is a 1, and uh, it's not in position A, which is a 0. So down here, um, this is our virtual channel, channel number 160, and we're just simply labeling it on-air power in kilowatts. And here's the calculation, very simple calculation that we need to do. We can take channel 158, which is transmitter A's power, multiply it by status 158. Status 158 is either going to be a 1 or a 0. In this case, it's a zero. So when we multiply uh, this term, it becomes zero. And you can add it to transmitter B. Uh, and transmitter B's uh, transmitter power output here is indicated at 27.4 kilowatts. Status channel uh, 159 is a one. That means that uh, this channel will be defined as the, um, simply the value of um, the transmitter output power for transmitter B. So we have one meter here to look at. That's all we have, and this is labeled on-air transmitter. So this will show the power output for the antenna that happens to be feeding the, an, uh, the antenna. Um, and why would you want to do that? Well, 
If there is, if you have an operator that um, you don't want to have an, uh, a, a large number of meters and you just want to have a meter that shows what you're putting out on the air, this is probably a very simple and straightforward way to do that if the operator is not very technical and doesn't want to deal with a whole bunch of different meters and finding out which, uh, which uh, position the coax, which is in this, this virtual channel calculation, will do that for you. Uh, Boolean logic functions. Um, using two logical operators on two or more status channels to determine the value of a new virtual channel. This is helpful to, for defining valid or invalid combinations of status inputs. Um, virtual channel processing is, of course, running all the time in the background. So if something happens, um, this processing that's going on in the background will um, indicate that right away. Here's an example of, of using Boolean logic to take a look at uh, different coax switch combinations. And um, I just got th through doing a job in Utah where we had actually six um, uh, coax switches on the output of a two combiner network feeding two different antennas. Um, and it got pretty complex as a matter of, as, as, as we can see with six switches, there's 64 different combinations, two to the sixth power of switches uh, being in different states. However, in the case of the installation I was working on in Utah, there were only nine valid modes. So it's important to be able to um, figure out whether the system is in a mode that's uh, considered valid or invalid um, because if you put too much power into a, a system that is not configured properly, we can obviously do damage there. So um, I put together a very simple um, demonstration of this for just two switches and using Boolean logic in the remote control to figure out what mode you're in and then you can take that mode information and determine whether you want to have the interlocks opened or closed or you want to drop the transmitter power to half power if you're into an aux antenna that can't handle uh, the full power. So here we have uh, two coax switches and we have uh, a transmitter feeding um, uh, either antenna A on the left, antenna B on the right, or a dummy load. And as you can see in this position, the, the coax switches are both in position number one. Um, and in this, if you follow the path of the RF from the transmitter here, it is simply feeding the dummy load. And that would be considered mode number one, where switch one is in position one and switch two is in position one as well. If we go to mode two, transmitter two is feeding antenna two. That's with position one for coax switch one and position two for coax switch two. Um, mode three um, simply has the transmitter feeding um, the, the, the first antenna, antenna number one. And four, um, we switched uh, coax switch two, but it really doesn't matter because transmitter's still feeding um, the, the first antenna. So what we can do is use the logic functions of a remote control to take a look at what's going on and, and determine um, by these virtual channels here, virtual channel number five, six, seven, eight, and nine. Virtual five, six, seven, and eight define the modes, the operating modes, and uh, or indicate the operating modes. And they're defined by this logic statement here where if S1 and S3 are true, um, and again, S1 um, is, uh, is coax switch number one in position one, and S3 is coax switch uh, number two in position one. And if we go back here to mode one, you see that they're both in position one. And if this rings true, then this status channel here, mode one, would be a one, and it would tell you that you're in that position. So I won't go through all of them, but you can see how we're looking at um, different um, s switch position combinations, and in this case, there's only four of them. And uh, what we can do is we can define any valid mode, which is handy for opening or closing interlocks. Um, and how, how we do that is we say if status number five, six, seven, or eight, if any of these are valid, um, we can tell that um, we're in a valid mode. And that way we can display that information. We can also um, close interlocks. 
Automated site functions respond immediately to off-air events. I was alluding to this at the beginning, where you can have remote controls that are used to um, take care of uh, switching alternate transmitters on the air such that they detect a failure with um, RF um, forward power output. Um, they can, you can switch audio sources based on the loss of silent sense or the loss of PP enco PPM encoding. Um, you can energize uh, de-icing equipment based on environmental conditions such as the dew point and temperature getting uh, too close together. And there are many ways to do this. Um, uh, many remote control companies have come up with easy ways of uh, graphically looking at these um, uh, situations and flowcharting them. And this is an example of an easy way to do that. You can uh, drag and drop these symbols. And when you save this uh, into, the, into the remote control or on your PC, um, these kind of automated functions will occur automatically. So it uh, allows for graphical editing and, um, and it's very easy to implement. And of course, um, this is nothing new, but um, Scheduling calendar events are very handy. For example, of course, for AM directional stand, um, pattern changes and muting tower light alarms during daylight hours, that can all be scheduled in on most modern remote controls today. Timed functions. Um, this is something um, that we've started offering recently, and uh, I think some other uh, remote control manufacturers have as well. You can keep track of how long uh, certain statuses are in uh, either true or false positions helping you keep um, uh, elapsed time records, keeping track of tube life, monitoring elapsed time for tower illumination, measuring run times for nitrogen generators is one of the more interesting things we've been able to do recently where uh, if there is a small leak and you notice a pattern change with um, the run times of your nitrogen generators, you can um, actually get to that information quicker and, um, and be proactive in terms of um, um, repairing the, repairing the um, equipment. Um, tracking AC generator runtime for maintenance records, looking at uh, total runtime for transmitters, etc. Alarm roll-ups, multiple alarms might come in simultaneously, and so you need to re uh, really determine the root cause. And the ability to suppress uh, alarms that are just uh, flooding your system in order to actually see and understand what's going on is really important. So for example, a power failure may cause a bunch of stuff to happen, like a silent sense alarm will go off, PPM alarms might go off, uh, utility under voltage, um, utility power loss, uh, UPS alarms, transmitter RF alarms, etc. Uh, even the generator starting alarm. So, this can be very overwhelming to an engineer when you get 17 alarms at once and you're trying to figure out what's going on. Well, of course, all these alarms are going to go off because your power failed. Um, so there's the ability to roll up and prioritize these alarms so that in the event of a power failure, you can still see all these other alarms, but the priority is going to be on the power failure so you know what's going on there. Repetitive alarms. Um, this is something that's dogged me for many years. Uh, for example, when STL strength um, comes and goes uh, in uh, variable weather conditions and you're constantly getting alarms uh, every few seconds or every few minutes that your um, signal strength is not what it should be for an STL, um, you can uh, take um, advantage of some remote control features to define a rearm uh, delay period such that you're not going to get these alarms every few seconds. You might get them once an hour and say, OK, I know what's going on here. I don't need to be bothered every 30 seconds with a, a text message. Um, and you can disable the, um, the alarm for a period of time as well. We do. Oh. A little, okay, great. And I'm just going to wrap up here talking a little bit about antenna uh, monitoring and protection. I thought I was going to go short here, Ross. <laughs> um, the popularity of uh, common antennas and combiners continues to increase, and the TV repack um, causes logical and convenient rebuild opportunities to include the installation of protection equipment. Technology for detecting RS, RF faults keeps getting better and faster. Often these systems um, are combined with interlock protection, like I was talking about with the Boolean logic for um, uh, 
determining what uh, modes you're in, as well as RF patch panels and com complex RF switching matrix matrices. Um, this is an example of um, some monitoring and protection that, uh, that I've been involved in recently using um, RF sensors to go on the directional couplers of um, transmission lines to measure forward and reflected power and to summarize all this information in a, uh, a logical control center that can uh, not only protect from VSWR faults but also um, look at uh, modes and uh, protect from um, interlocks being open when they, when they should be closed and vice versa. This is an example of some of the stuff uh, that, that I've done at the Prudential Building in Boston uh, for a series of four FM stations up there. And it kind of just brings all the information together. Um, the ability to measure temperatures is also um, very helpful. You can look at room temperatures, you can look at filter temperatures and transmission line temperatures, nitrogen pressures. Um, so a lot of, lot of um, new technology and new things that we can do in terms of uh, looking at these trends. So sorry I'm going a little bit over there, but um, that is uh, a kind of a primer on where we are today with um, remote controls. And I know I'm a little bit over, so I will conclude there. Okay.